Well, I'm an academic. I come from Australia. Um, I'm a transsexual woman. Um, and when we were asked um, to tell our stories, I sort of mentioned both those, those issues. Um, and I've done research on a range of gender issues in education. Um, I'm one of the people, I guess, who opened up research issues about men and masculinities. Um, and I've done research on other kinds of social justice issues and uh, constructions of knowledge. Yeah. And, and it listed in, um, in your description for the conference that you were the author of Masculinities, mm -hmm. the book. Um, but, but you also, like you just mentioned, um, other, other fields or, or topics. So could you sure. just give a, a rundown, a quick, not comprehensive, but a, a few other things that you've written, whether they're books or, or studies, but um, just give like the kind of the back cover. Blue. Sure, yeah. sure. Um, well, one of my recent books is called Southern Theory, and that's um, a, an account of um, intellectual work, um, accounts of knowledge, analyses of knowledge that come not from the global north, but from the global, global south, from intellectuals of India, Africa, Latin America, um, and Iran, uh, which I put together to show the richness and wealth of intellectual production from the global periphery, which is not normally recognized in mainstream social science. So it's a part of an attempt to democratize the social sciences. Um, I've also written a book called Schools and Social Justice, uh, which is about poverty and education uh, and how we might rethink education um, for, to the advantage of children in poverty rather than always having education systems that work to the advantage of children in wealth. Um, and I've done sociological research in schools before that, which looked at uh, the way class relations, class inequalities, work in education, how they, they interplay with gender relations and so forth. So uh, I have a fairly diverse background yeah. as a researcher. And I think I saw on your website there's a list of your top ten picks of mm -hmm. uh, Yeah. That's so right. if, if people want to go check out more, what's, what's the address? Uh, well, there's going to be, there's a website in construction, okay. uh, um, raymondconnell.net. Uh, it will be quite soon. Well, there's already a little bit there, so okay. Okay, please, please join me. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, now, now, to get to that masculinities topic, um, I, I had, um, heard a video or seen a video, um, you were describing masculinities, and basically what I understood was that um, it, it's a set of behaviors, um, that how people act, and, and there's different masculinities. So, um, mm -hmm. That's correct. Um, not only individual behavior, either, but I think this is very important, uh, social practices, organized social practices by groups and in interactions too, is part of what constructs part of the meaning of, of masculinity. So when you're looking at masculinities, you're not looking at only an individual personality or character, you're also looking at football teams and corporations and uh, armies, uh, governments and so forth, uh, all of which are involved in constructing gender. Um, and one of the crucial findings uh, when, when this research field developed uh, about 20 years ago, um, one of the crucial findings is that there's no one thing that you can call masculinity. There are multiple masculinities. There are different patterns of social practice, different patterns of behavior. Um, and very typically, if you go, for instance, and do research in a school, you'll find a number of different patterns of masculinity that boys are learning or practicing, uh, and which have often sort of hierarchical relationships between them. So there might be one version of masculinity which is more honored in that school than others, others which are regarded as infant diggers or, or positively uh, looked down or frowned on. Um, and that's often where you get the relationship with sexuality because uh, very often, well, it's not universal, but very often the hegemonic, the, the, the most honored, uh, the powerful version of masculinity is heterosexual. Um, whereas dis, um, you know, disavowed, rejected forms of masculinity 
are often associated rightly or wrongly with being gay. Um, so I mean, it's an odd fact that comes out of research with younger boys that often uh, you find boys accusing each other of being fags or, or woofters or some denigratory term like that long before they learn the sexual meaning of it but they just know that that's a derogatory thing to say to, to a boy. So you get hierarchies, social and cultural hierarchies of masculinity. And that's quite an important fact about the way the gender system, the gender order as a whole works. Now do people fit into different parts of the hierarchy depending on situation? Well, or, or it's kind of like you'll have a person and they'll be in one of the hierarchies? Or well, very often that's the case, yeah. But it's not a group. Remember, this is often yeah. collective. Uh, so you'll have a, a group, a peer group, for instance, in the school who, who represent the, the most admired, respected form of masculinity. Or you may find a situation also happens where there's kind of competition for hegemony between different constructions of masculinity. So you sometimes find a situation where, you know, a, a rough, tough, uh, dominating form of masculinity um, exists, but there's a kind of more technically oriented more knowledge-oriented, more professional version of masculinity, and they may be in competition for, for the place in the sun. Um, and that can you know, be a very interesting situation indeed uh, when, when that is happening. Where, where do you think masculinities, these things you're describing, have, have developed from? Is there a history? And oh, well, there's a history as long as human society, basically, because gender is about how our reproductive bodies enter into social processes and enter into human history, basically. That's fundamental what gender is. Uh, so there are constructions of masculinity and femininity throughout history, uh, which kids learn as they grow up. And this is a social process, so children learn masculinity. Girls learn masculinities too, sometimes practice it. They're tomboys and so forth, and some women grow up with a, a masculine repertoire of behavior. Um, but mostly boys and men do. Um, and because it's learned, because it's historically constructed, it's always open to change. It's always possible that uh, patterns of masculinity will change, and not always for the better. Uh, so you can get um, you know, historical moments where a, a, a violent and dominating form of masculinity becomes dominant in the society, and uh, that can be very damaging and dangerous for other people, of course. Yeah. Would you say that um, there's kind of just been a general development in one direction over the past, say, whatever, whatever period we're looking at as recent history, or has, oh. or has it kind of been in flux and changing um, in different ways? Uh, I, I would say definitely not all in one direction. I mean, gender is a very complex terrain, um, and, and gender change is a turbulent process. So yes, if you look at the opinion polls about gender equality, then in many countries, perhaps most countries, there has been an intergenerational shift in the last generation towards more uh, and more equal, uh, you know, attitudes that favour more equality between men and women. But there are also situations in the world where things have gone very badly wrong for women. I wouldn't want to be growing up as a girl child in Russia at the moment, for instance, with a kind of new patriarchy being constructed there. I wouldn't want to grow, um, I wouldn't want to be a young woman on the borderland between Mexico and the United States where there's a horrendous amount of gender-based violence, which has risen in uh, the last couple of decades as a result of you know, the social upheaval, economic change, free trade, all sorts of things have caused it. So things can go wrong as well as things can go right, and that's what makes gender, um, you know, the, the, the politics of gender both difficult and urgent. Yeah. So if, if we're talking about masculinities or hegemonic mas masculinities, um, you were saying that, that some um, some women or girls might also have masculinities. Absolutely, yeah. sure. But um, sure. are there are there feminine femininities too? Yeah, indeed. And um, um, th uh, this is perhaps a less uh, active area of research. 
uh, but there is certainly research which traces the construction of femininity uh, among girls and women. And um, I mean, there's a lot of research, for instance, about models of femininity in the mass media, the kinds of imagery of, of femininity that we find in women's magazines, on television, and so forth. So that's there. And you don't find the same patterns uh, of femininity as you find uh, patterns of masculinity, because the overall position of men and women in the gender order is different. And that's what feminism is about, because of the massive economic and political inequalities. Uh, but uh, there are different kinds of femininity. Um, I, I don't think you typically find a, uh, if you like, a hegemonic femininity that has cultural authority in the same way as you do with masculinity. And that relates to the overall gender power imbalance between men and women. Yeah. So I, I was wondering, do you think like um, that maybe, I don't know if the word would be enabling, but if a, a pattern, patterns of femininity might enable the, these like violent masculinities, or do you think the masculinity is kind of just asserting itself, not not at all formed by? Kind of well, it? look, gender is an interactive system. Gender is a relation, um, and what happens among men and what happens among women are intimately connected. And there's no doubt about that. Um, I don't think. Um, it, it's um, generally the case that particular patterns of conduct, particular patterns of femininity, call out, um, you know, the assertion of power by men, or let alone the assertion of violence. I don't think that's uh, a documented reality. Um, I think there are different strategies that women adopt. Uh, in a situation where men have predominant power, uh, for instance, predominant economic power, and women, or most women, are economically dependent, then there will be different strategies that different groups of women adopt in response to that. Some are more combative, some are more accepting or compromising. You will find that for sure. Yeah. So um, I guess when you're talking about um, masculinities that, that produce violence, um, I guess it would, it would include physical violence or economic violence. Well, both. Yeah, sure. And, and so that's, um, that's something you were talking about, interventions, in mm -hmm. terms of how do, how do we change this dynamic? Yeah. Um, look, there's a lot of work that goes on about this. Um, not, uh, it doesn't attract much public attention, usually, but there's work in the schools, there's work in development agencies, there are community programs. Um, uh, around such things as violence prevention, that's one of the major uh, areas of, of action, uh, that are trying to change entrenched patterns, for instance, of domestic violence. I have a student, for instance, who's working on that in Cambodia, one of the most traumatized countries in the world, um, where uh, you know the experience of violence is, is just extraordinary. Um, so, uh, th there's actually quite a lot of local activism around violence reduction, changing patterns of masculinity to try to sustain more equal, less violent relationships with women. Um, and of course, a lot of you know feminist activity um, is also trying to change patterns of interaction between men and women, with the implied consequence that this may also change patterns of masculinity among men. As men and boys uh, come to learn more democratic uh, and respectful and equal ways of behaving towards women, this will change the dynamics of masculinity. So, so what ways, um, either in learning the, those democratic um, patterns or, or just in, um, in combating violence, what, what works? What works to change things? Uh, that too, that's very situational. So what might work in a white suburb in Canada might not work at all in Wales, one of the cities of violence against women in Mexico, and what works there or doesn't work there may or may not work in India. So I, I'm reluctant to say there's a one-size-fits-all solution, because no, no. it's not. Um, but you can say, uh, I think broadly, uh, that Involving men 
in developing their own strategies for change is really important. It's not just a matter of how I shake the finger at men saying you're bad, being bad boys and do it differently. Uh, men themselves have to be engaged in, uh, in the process of changing gender relations. Often men find it very interesting to do this. Uh, boys in schools want to learn about gender. It matters to them, it's important in their lives. Um, so that kind of community education process I have a reasonable amount of faith in. Uh, but you also need to work with institutions so that a lot of gender-based violence comes from the military from or through the police, uh, the prison system. These are all fairly violent institutions. So we need to be working with and about them too uh, to try to produce more peaceable and respectful means of social control in, in the community. And then, of course, there are situations like my um, student in Cambodia where you're dealing with post-conflict societies which are very traumatised and then you're basically, you may be rebuilding things from a very basic level and it will be a matter of designing institutions um, in ways that are gender inclusive and, and relatively, relatively democratic. You, you touched on it with the, when you're talking about young boys wanting to learn, mm -hmm. um, but something that just I thought I thought of is that like how do you get people who aren't necessarily inspired or, or, or want to change? And, and when you're talking about institutions, do do the military really want to to change how they work, or does the prison system really want to change how it works? Many of them absolutely do not. That's absolutely right. But some do. Um, it's an incremental process. I mean, you cannot. Uh, we're dealing with a system of privilege uh, and exclusion, and the people who benefit from that system are extremely unlikely to engage immediately in a large program of change. I mean, we know that doesn't happen in any system of power or, or inequality. Um, but even in you know fairly um, hierarchical and even violent institutions, uh, some people can see that perhaps their long-term survival or the long-term welfare of the society depends on something changing. Parents often want, to give another example, parents often want good gender education in the schools because they know that the world their kids will be living in is different from the world they grew up in. And they want the best for their kid not necessarily a reproduction of what they got from their parents. Um, so, um, you know, you, you have, I mean, opinions are divided on all of these kinds of things, and you don't expect a total response. Uh, you expect an incremental process of change if you're going to get change at all. And you were saying not everything is, uh, okay, everybody is, but just not everyone's on the same uh on the same way, no. well, that's, that's what the research says, there are different patterns of masculinity. And that, that tells you from the start there will be different responses to any proposals for, uh, for change. Yeah. Actually, where I was going with that is just um, the, the concept of subjectivity, uh, yourself as a researcher. Ah, yes. Um, where, where are you personally coming from and what's informing the mm -hmm. way you look at, at the situation or the problems or the, yeah. the concepts? Well, I'm, I'm a researcher, but I'm not an individual. I'm, not, I'm part of research teams, out of which this has come. Uh, so it's about, you know, to a large extent, about the debates that are going on in the field, the research techniques that are available, and the kind of rethinking that I might have done of these uh, that inform my research. I, think it's, I don't think it's the case usually that that researcher, at any rate, significant research, just reflects the personal opinions of the researcher. Um, that said, it's also the case that my interest in this field arises from the fact that I, you know, have been engaged in gender politics for a long time. I've been a supporter of feminist movements. I've worked with gay men and supported, um, you know, community education around AIDS. Um, and I've grappled with gender issues in my personal life as a transsexual woman. Um, so all of that, I guess, has made me interested in the, the field and maybe a little bit uh, has helped me to become aware of the contradictions and complexity 
in data, which is good for research, of course. And does it inform your vision or your um, the purpose of why you do this? Um, well, I certainly want a world that's safe for me to live in. I want a world that's safe for my daughter to live in. And, you know, more broadly, I want a world that's safe for my friends in relation to their children, my community, and for other communities to live in. I guess that's, I feel my personal interest in this is a small part of a much larger interest in changing.